I believe it's true that how we think is how we will act, or we will act on the basis of what we've come to believe is true. For example, if you believe that life is really meaningless, that it doesn't matter what we do, then you're not going to have any problems with things like abortion and abuse and um, euthanasia and things like that, because life doesn't really matter anyhow. If you've come to believe that power is the measure of whether a person is significant or not, then you're not going to have any problems acting in a way that you're walking over people in order to get to the top, because that's really what's most important. Well, I, I tell you this because what we've been doing in the book of Hebrews, for nine and a half chapters in the book of Hebrews, what has been happening is we've been being taught how to think correctly about Jesus. Um, that, that's the foundation. He knows that we need to think clearly about Jesus, that he is superior, that he is the supreme one. He is superior over Moses. He's superior over the angels. He's superior over the temple. He's superior over the sacrifices. He's, the covenant that he establishes is superior over the old covenant. All that stuff. He wants us to get that right so that we can now begin to act on that. And when we start here in, in uh, chapter 10, verse 19, we see application. And what's going to happen to the rest of the book of Hebrews now is he's going to apply this. And there's over 40 different um, imperatives, injunctions, commands that he's going to give us in these last several chapters of the book of Hebrews. And so today, we're finally going to get to application. What are we supposed to do with all this information that we've been working on? And he begins here in verse 19, and so. Now that's always a good indication, and so, here's the application, right? And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Now notice all this stuff about there, there's a new place to go, there's doors that are open. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rolls over God's house, and then he's going to give us some applications. So the idea here is he said all the stuff that we've been talking about, that the, all the stuff that Jesus has done so that we can now be made new in Christ, so that we are justified, made as if we've never sinned, and in the process of becoming holy, we, we now, the doors are open. There's, there's great things for us to do, and now he's going to tell us how to walk that road, the direction that we should go. This is, and you've got to get the right order of this. He's not saying do these things so that you can be justified. He's saying, since you're justified, made right with God, here's the way you should live. What he's going to do now is he's going to give us four, this morning we're going to look at four commands, and they're really easy to pick up. This is called, in some respects, the salad portion of Hebrews. And the reason it's called that is because there's a predominance of let us. Let us, you know. So, so there's lots of let us in this passage, so they call it the salad portion of Hebrews. Wasn't my idea, it's just what some people call it. So here we go, we're going to look at verse 22. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So the points are really easy to find. You go to let us, and you got the first one. Let us, the second one, okay? So this is simple. The first thing he tells us is that we should enter with sincerity rather than with fear and doubt. God has opened this way, and he says, go in. Take advantage of it. It's easy for us to learn a lot of stuff and never do anything with it. You, know, you, you fill up notebooks worth of good notes, and then you put it up on the shelf. And he's saying, don't, don't do that. Enter. Act on it. God's opened a door. Go in. It's great to learn all this stuff about the gospel. Okay, we're forgiven because of what Jesus has done. That's great. You know, just have faith in him. The question is, have you done anything with that? 
Have you acted on that? Have you exercised faith? Have you said, yes, I'm going to embrace him. I'm going to ask him to come into me and, and, and change me. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to actually act in faith. Have you done that? So the first thing you're supposed to do it, you're supposed to enter. The second thing is that we're supposed to enter boldly and not tentatively. That's a problem for us, isn't it? Because I say, I, what business do I have of entering into God's presence like that? I know the bad stuff that I've done. Here's the key, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and the new has come. We can enter boldly because our past, our sin, our stain, our, our dirtiness has been dealt with. And he says, now, now go boldly. Know that God has opened the door. You don't, there's, there's nothing, there are no charges on you. You don't have to worry about this anymore. You go in there and enjoy let me give you a kind of a corny illustration, but hopefully it'll drive the point home to you. Suppose you lived in Washington, D.C., and you were a kid, all right? Not a goat, but a child. Um, and, and, and so you're, you're this child, and, and every day you're just fascinated with the White House. You know, you walk by the White House, and you say, what, what a neat place. And so every once in a while, you stop at the gates of the White House, and you say to the Secret Service agent out there, can I go in and see the White House? I've always wanted to see the White House. No. Go away. Okay, so you're, you're really fascinated. So you go to the library, and you get all these books about the White House, all the ones that have all the pictures, and, and you, you learn everything there is about the White House. You could give tours about the White House, even though you've never been in there. You know that you will recognize every single room in the White House because you've seen all the pictures. You've amassed all this information. So you go to the gate of the White House, and you say, I really happen to know a lot about the White House, and uh, can I come in? No. Then one day, everything changes, and, and you get to go into the White House. And you know what changes? Your dad gets elected president of the United States. Now, you haven't done anything. Your dad's the one that's been elected. But you, as his child, now are granted access to the White House. And now, if you happen to be standing on the outside, on the, the, the gate outside the White House, you know what they're saying to you now? What are you doing out there? Get in here! You know, it's, it's changed. Everything has changed. That's kind of what... It's like with us, that we've been on the outside. We, we, we wanted to come in. We wanted to be God's friends, but we had all this sin that was a problem. We were excluded from the kingdom of God because we just have not lived the kind of life that God expected us to live and demanded us to live. But now Jesus, as our father, in a sense, Jesus has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. And because of that, we become part of his family. And we should enter boldly. We should enter enthusiastically. We should be excited about being part of this. So the first command is to enter into his presence with sincerity instead of with fear and doubt. We've got to stop being wimpy Christians. We should be excited that we are God's children and we should be proud of that fact. Second, verse 23, he says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. We should be confident in the way that we live our life because God does what he says. Not because we're consistent, but because he's consistent. We should be people who hold firmly to hope, knowing that God can be depended on to do what God has said he would do. Now, we say, well, is there, is there a way to develop this hope? I'm, I'm not a very hopeful person. Well, glad you asked that question because I actually have some good things for you. Number one, ground yourself in sound doctrine. Doctrine is what we believe. And there's people who say, I don't want to deal with theology, I just want to follow Jesus, which is a dumb thing to say. Because you can't follow Jesus unless you decide who Jesus is. And when you decide who Jesus is, you're engaging in theology. Okay? Theology is just what we believe about God. So we are people who are need to study sound doctrine. We need to know what is true. We need these first nine and a half chapters of the book of Hebrews. We need that. We need to learn what God says. Second, we need to learn how to focus on the sufficiency of Christ. Because as you and I look at ourselves, I don't know about you, but I look at myself and I can't do this. Oh, I'm never going to be that kind of a person. The more I look at myself, the more doubt there is. The more I look at Jesus, the more confident I become. 
And I look at him and I remember what he has said and I remember his promises and I remember what he's done. I remember his track record. I remember that he is perfectly consistent. And that leads to the third thing. We need to remind ourselves that God is absolutely faithful. The problem is that we look at God and we think of his faithfulness kind of like our faithfulness. You know, we try to be faithful, but there's some times where we make promises and we just can't keep them. Th something comes up, something unanticipated. We can't keep the promise. And we think God is like that. That God makes promises, but you know, he may not be able to keep it. Not the case with God. God always, always keeps his promises. When he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Nothing will ever separate you from my love. Um, when he promises that he will see us through the tough times. When he says, call on me and I will answer you, he's going to do those things. And so we, can, we will grow in hope as we focus on the God's character rather than on our insufficiencies. So that's the second let us. Third, verse 24, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. So he's saying we need to start taking responsibility to help each other grow. That's pretty good. We need to find ways to motivate rather than compete. We need to try to spur one another on rather than always feeling like we're in competition with, with each other. Because isn't there that sense in which we live our lives thinking if, if somebody, there's only so many blessings that go around, you know, and if you get a blessing, there's less blessing for me. And so we feel like we're competing with each other, like we're playing king of the mountain. That's, that's not the way it is. He's saying we should, we should see each other and, and we should be people who are cheering for each other. Think about um, going to, a, let's say, a, a high school sporting event, um, a grade school sporting event. And, and if you just sit there sometimes and just, just listen to the crowd, it's interesting. There are some people who just are complaining about everything. The referees are stupid. Uh, the coach isn't very smart. The other team is cheating. I mean, you just hear this. And, and a lot of times, those same people are actually yelling at their own team. Come on, let's, let's get your head out of here, you know. Really? And they yell at their own child. And the child, you can see the child's out there and they're wincing. You know, oh, yeah, they're related to me. Oh, jeez. <laughs> You know, and then they're embarrassed, and you see that out there, right? And, and, and we're embarrassed for them. We say, wow, you know, you're not helping anything. Just because you had a bad day doesn't mean you should take it out on everybody else. And then you've got these other people who are, who are really positive, and they're cheering for everybody. Oh, good play, even if it's the other team. Oh, what a great, oh, way to go, coach. Way to encourage the team. You guys out there in, in, the, in the striped jerseys, I know you're doing your best. Even though it's not very good, but even I know you're doing your best. <laughs> and, and they're out there cheering, and afterwards they put their arm around their child, and they say, hey, did you have fun? Yeah, I did. Ah, even though you lost, it's okay. It's only a game. Just have fun. Go out there and enjoy your teammates. Now, here's the question. Which of these kinds of people are you? The person who's always picking at other people or the person who's cheering for other people? It's a good question. The idea here is that we should be looking to motivate other people. And that's a good word. So, so what can we do to motivate other people? Well, I've got several things here. Number one, set a good example. There's nothing that motivates other people better than seeing somebody do what should be done. Um, when, when we see somebody who perseveres in really tough times, it inspires us, it motivates us to be more faithful. When we see somebody who, is, who dares to forgive, we are motivated. When we see somebody whose life has, has really changed because of their relationship with Jesus, it motivates us. When we see somebody who goes out of their way to help other people, it motivates us. So, 
So set a good example. Desire that, that one of the best ways that I can motivate other people is to live out my faith in a consistent way. Second, study and pay attention to what other people need. Uh, when, when we talk um, to, to couples that are getting married and to people who are married and going through difficulties, one of the books we love to give people is The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. And, and Chapman points out, he says, you know, marriage is people, people feel loved in different ways. And, and he goes in and he says, he's picked out five love languages, there may be more, but he says some people feel loved because of physical touch. You know, you, you hug, you kiss, you hold hands, and they feel loved when you do that. Some people feel loved when you, when you do things for them, when you serve them, when you fulfill your obligations, when you do little things around the house. Some people feel loved when you give them quality time. Some people feel loved when you affirm them. And there's another one, but I don't remember what it is. But there's five of them. What is it? Gifts. Gifts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Allison's hoping to get a gift today. So <laughs> it's, her, it's her anniversary. She wants a really nice gift for her anniversary. <laughs> if somebody has Tyler's number, you might text him right now. It's <laughs> Allison is looking for some nice gift, buddy. Um, so that, that's the other one, gifts. And so, you know, giving people stuff. So here's what happens sometimes, that, that in a relationship, you, you may be speaking different languages. That for me, I feel loved this way, but the other person may feel loved with something entirely different. So I'm trying to express love through my love language. They're trying to express love through theirs, and it's, it's like you're speaking Chinese and Spanish. You know, you're just missing each other. And it's really kind of a cool thing that you need to learn the love language of another person. So for example, you may be trying to, you know, poor Tyler, he may be trying to hug his wife and all that stuff and saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to show her how much I care about it. And what she really wants is a nice gift, you know, <laughs> and, and she'll feel, <laughs> people who are watching this on YouTube won't understand this at all, that's okay. <laughs> But, but she will feel, and it doesn't have to be an expensive gift. You know, it could be something really tender, something special, something that, that shows that, that he's been paying attention. Um, you may, by the same token, be, be buying really expensive gifts for your, your spouse. And, and what they really want is for you just to remember to take out the garbage. You know, if you would just do those kinds of things, it would mean the world to me. Okay, so here's, we take that same principle and apply it to the church. That, that we're going to encourage people in different ways. Some people are going to be encouraged when you go up and you give them a hug. Other people are going to go, ooh, mm, personal space, you know, mm, don't, don't do that. Some people are going to be encouraged when you, you say to them, can, can I just pray with you right now? Some people are going to be encouraged when, when, when you actually just listen to them and and sometimes they're encouraged when they see a tear in your eye and they know that you, you care. Um, we need to study each other. We need to figure out what it is that will encourage another person. We have to pay attention. We can't just say, this is what would mean something to me. I've, I've got I've to figure out what would mean something to you. And then my job is to try to do that. Third, we need to lead the way in reconciliation. Um, you know, when we're dealing with with people, and we're dealing with difficult people. In fact, there's a good book out by that name, Difficult People, written by two scholars. Um, that'd be Rick and I. Um, <laughs> that, that basically the premise of the book is this. That first of all, you need to accept the fact that, that you may be the difficult person. And that you have a responsibility to be the person who goes to another person. You know, Jesus was really interesting in, in what he did. He said that if you know that somebody has a problem with you, you need to go to them, and you need to resolve that problem before you ever even go to church. And then he said, if, if you have a problem with someone, you need to go with them and reconcile it. So whether you have a problem or they have a problem, he says, you know whose responsibility it is? Yours. You go. And you know why he did that? Because he knows that we will always wait for the other person to do something. And Jesus said, don't do that. Take responsibility. You be the one that resolves the problem. And then fourth, 
Look for the good. Look for things to celebrate in another person rather than the things to uh, condemn. I don't know about you, but, but there are plenty of people around that will pile on when bad things happen. There are plenty of people who are going to poke their bony finger in your chest and point out all the bad things you're doing. Don't you long for those people who cheer for you? Uh, those people who, when, when you tell them about your vacation, you know, there's one group that must be nice. Yes, oh, you know, just, you just drain the joy out. But then there's those people that you say, I'm, I'm going on vacation. You say, oh, that's fantastic. How was your vacation? Did you have a good time? And they share your joy, and those people make your joy richer, don't they? And the challenge for us is to be the kind of people who, who celebrate with people, who catch them doing good things, rather than always looking for the bad things that we can point out. And then there's the fourth, let us. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I told you you'd be glad you came today. You did this one. This is something that's becoming a problem in our society. People are finding all kinds of reasons not to come to worship. And, and they give lots of excuses. Um, for example, oh, you don't know, we had, a, we had an event. And we, we had this thing that we had to do. Um, our kids were in a game, or our family was having a reunion, or on and on and on. That's a problem. Because we're making a deliberate choice to put something else above God. We say, but I can't help it. You know, they're scheduling all these things on Sundays now. Do you know why they're scheduling things on Sundays? Because Christian people are not saying, I am not going to participate when it's on Sunday. At least Sunday morning. If all the Christians got together, if you had a meeting with all the Christian parents and said, look, somebody needs to stop this trend. And, and we need to say that Sunday morning, we're not doing it. We're not going to go to the family gathering. We're not going to play the sport. We're not going to, whatever the case may be, not going to go out with the guys hunting, whatever it is, and said, we're not going to do it. You know what's going to happen? They're going to stop scheduling things on Sunday morning. That's what's going to happen, because they're not going to have enough people to participate. And, and what we're teaching our kids is what really concerns me, that our children are watching the decisions that we're making and the the decision, you know, what they're coming away with is saying, okay, worship is important only if there's nothing better to do. And so we're making that decision, and when they come along, they're going to attend church even less, and their kids are going to attend church even less, because the world around us is going to continue to, to take Sunday away from us. So church attendance is going to continue to dive because we are wimping out. We're not making the right decisions. We're choosing to honor other things above the Lord. We say, well, that's not really what we're doing. Yes, it's exactly what we're doing. There are people who say, well, I only, I only get one day to sleep in a week, you know, and it, it's Sunday, and I really need my sleep. Interesting, though, those same people when hunting season is here, have no trouble getting up early, heading out on a vacation, they're going to go on uh, Spoon River Drive or whatever, no problem getting up early at all. Hmm, interesting. But I need my sleep. Do you know you can get more sleep not only by sleeping later in the morning, but by going to bed earlier the night before? Hmm. Again, it's a choice. You're making a choice to say that there's all these other things that are way more important to me than God is. God, you know, if, if you were higher up on my list, then I'd go to, you know, I, I'd get up. That's the problem, isn't it? That he's not higher up on the list. Third, some people say, well, I, I have to work on Sunday. I get that. <laughs> I'm working on Sunday. I, I get it. But you know what I'm finding is, is that when Christian people, and, and some people have to work, I, I get that. Um, 
But a lot of people, if, if you actually talk to your employers and say, you know, Sunday mornings is, is a very special time for me and for my family. Is there a way to work out my schedule so that I can have my Sunday mornings free? A lot of employers will, will bend over backwards to accommodate you if you ask it in, in a kind uh, way. And we just don't ask. And maybe because we're embarrassed that we want to worship God. There are people who aren't going to come to church because they're afraid. They're afraid that they won't fit in. There are people who don't come to church because they don't, they don't like church people. Oh, I've been there once. Those people are terrible. I don't like those people. Let me read you a quote um, that, uh, that I read from William Barclay. He writes, There is no man who can live the Christian life and neglect the fellowship of the church. If any man feels that he can do so, let him remember that he comes to church not only to get, but to give. If he thinks that the church has faults, it is his duty to come in and help to mend them. And then there's people who don't want to come to church because of shame. They have removed themselves from worship because they've messed up, things are going bad in their life, and they just don't want to face other people. And you know, frankly, I think this is as much an indictment of the church as it is the individual. This is supposed to be a place where hurting people find grace and mercy. Where else should somebody turn who's going through a tough time? Where else do broken people go to find God's grace and mercy? There's something wrong with the fact that um, some people find more acceptance at the tavern than they do in the church. We need to work on this. People should come to this place and find that people's arms are open rather than crossed. Is that really the message? For those of you who are too embarrassed to worship because you faced a struggle, you need to remember that we are all sinners. None of us have it all together. We've all failed, and we will all fail again somewhere along the line. And that goes for every one of us, including your pastors. We are broken people who have all come together to the Lord for healing. Our fellowship, when we get together, we should be like a cancer support group. You know, people who, who are sharing the things that we've learned and some of the victories that we've gained and, and finding people to cry with us and the, the struggles that we've had. That's what the church is supposed to be, people who gather together to encourage each other. And it's interesting that the passage ends by saying, encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. But that's not a separate command. We don't see, let us encourage one another. This is part of the worship thing. And what he's trying to say is, look, when, when you worship together, when you participate in the communal group of the church, you are encouraging other people. Don't you feel that? You come out of church on Easter Sunday when everybody's been here, you feel pumped. You come out after the Christmas Eve Eve service and the church has been packed and you, you know, I say, boy, it was, it was, wasn't that, oh, wasn't that fun? Because we are reminded that we're not alone. We're reminded that, that we serve a God that has touched a lot of lives. And so even when you feel like you're not getting anything out of it, when you're here, you are encouraging the other people around you just by your presence. I know you encourage Rick and I. When, when you come out to the things that we do, it's an encouragement to others. When you sing out, other people are encouraged to sing, even if you've got a bad voice. You know, people around you, I guess, i got to sing louder, you know. <laughs> um, when, when you um, are, are involved in things, people are encouraged to be involved. When, when you pray for others, other people are encouraged to pray. When you keep coming to worship, even though your life is, is, is in the dumper, other people are encouraged to say, I can do this too, it's okay. Broken people can come here. When we're enthusiastic about the gospel, other people are going to be enthusiastic too. We need this time we spend together every week. It's not becoming less important, even though people are treating it like it's less important. It's more important than ever. As our society continues to decay, 
we are inching closer and closer to the day when Jesus Christ is going to return. And we need to be ready. Our times of worship need to have their highest priority. As values crumble, we need to be more determined than ever to get our children involved in Sunday school and the youth groups. Boy, they need the counterbalance to everything that they're getting hammered with from the world. As people become more and more outspoken against Christianity, and it is happening, we need to be equipped. We need our Bible studies. We need our Sunday school classes. We need our discussion groups so that we can learn how to think biblically in a foreign and hostile world. There has never been a greater urgency to think clearly and carefully about the truth of Scripture. We need it to stand personally, and we will need this knowledge to explain what we believe to others. How we think will determine how we live. If you are lax in your faith, you may not even recognize that you are compromising or denying the truth. So we need to be extra diligent. We need to be careful to hear what God is saying and to, and to evaluate our lives. Are we doing what he's telling us to do? Because other people are watching. Other people are looking at us and they're not hearing what we're saying. They're watching what we're doing. So my hope is that this will motivate you all the more to follow these simple, salad-like construction that he's given us in Hebrews chapter 10. Let's pray together. Father, it's easy for us to gain information and then to just leave it on the shelf. Help us not to be that way. Help us to be people who apply the truth. Help us to live out the truth. Help us to stop making excuses and to start doing what you tell us to do. Help us to remember what's at stake. Father, please motivate us that we might be people who draw other people to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As we